We've entered into what people often call Holy Week, those days that come uh, leading up to uh, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus and the resurrection, uh, those days afterwards. Jesus, as we see in chapter 11, has come to uh, Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Uh, he's uh, cleansed the temple. Uh, there's been the account of the fig tree that uh, our Lord cursed and said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And then the answer to that the following day was that the, the fig tree had withered. And then there was that lesson about prayer. And so we're in that day when Jesus and the disciples have seen this uh, uh, withered fig tree, withered at the roots. And then uh, verse 27 of Mark 11. Then they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question. Then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men... They feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Well, we look at that passage a little bit later on, but now let's just bow our heads in prayer uh, this morning. We come before you, O oh, gracious Father, and praise you and thank you that in this world in which we live, where there seems to be so much turmoil and, and trouble and evil and so many things that we thought perhaps were stable and secure and have been crumbling, uh, we realize that the only constant, unchanging thing in the whole of creation is uh, yourself. We praise you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we remind ourselves, Lord, this morning, how the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the ages to come, that there would be wars and rumors of wars and there would be these natural disasters. But the end is not yet. And Lord, we feel very much the sense of those end times in a way. Because, Lord, we're seeing in our own day and age such wars and rumors of wars and perhaps people are speculating uh, about things that might get even worse. And we are seeing, Lord, the various natural calamities that are happening, the floods, the drought, the earthquakes, the volcanic activity. And all these things, Lord, should be pointing us as your people to the very fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come again. And in fact, Lord, we, we have been uh, gathered around the table and we were to do this, uh, drinking of the wine and, of the, and, the, and breaking of the bread uh, until he comes. And we thank you, Lord, for the great promise that the Lord Jesus Christ will come again. But we're living through such times, Lord, when we long, we, we, we wish we desire that the Lord would come again and he would come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to put an end to all the things that we're seeing and experiencing at this present time. But we do pray, Lord, about the situation that's going on in different parts of the world. We have prayed about Ukraine and Russia and we know that that's still uh, taking place. And there's still that, those hostilities, there's still uh, violence happening, people are being slain. Uh, but uh, what's concerning our, our mind at the moment, Lord, is, uh, is uh, Palestine and Israel. Uh, Lord, the very place where the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, walked and taught and proclaimed the truth of your word. 
And we do pray, Lord, for these situation here. We, we gather, Lord, that there's going to be a climax to all this. Uh, at least that's what's being threatened by the people of Israel at the time. Uh, and Lord, we realize that in so many ways, this is just a, a demonstration to us of uh, man's inhumanity to man, the evil that can be found in the heart of men at times. And we would pray, Lord, especially for uh, the leaders, the leaders of communities, the leaders of nations. Uh, we pray for the United Nations, that this pressure might be uh, put upon those people who um, can, can stop this, and that there may be a real a cessation of uh, hostilities, there may be a real peace that will be put in place. We recognize, O oh Lord, that uh, that uh, your people are there on the ground in those places. Lord, we've been hearing about Jews and, and, um, and Palestinians, but we know also, Lord, that there are Palestinians who are Christians and there are Jews that are Christians and you have your churches there. And we just pray for your people in the midst of, uh, of this situation, that they may stay strong in faith, that they may be bold in the, in the gospel, that they may be pointing out uh, the need of, of Christ and, and, see, uh, and proclaiming him as the Messiah, the Christ, that these groups need, that he is the Prince of Peace. He is the almighty Son of God who came down upon earth to uh, take away sin, to pay the price for sin. And Lord, we see sin in, it, in all its uh, rawness, uh, Lord, at this present time, and just pray, Lord, that uh, your people uh, will be engaged in some way to be able to spread the good news of Jesus. We think of those particular uh, leaders of nations, those of powerful nations, who can put pressure to bear upon these warring factions, and pray that you may raise them up as people who have a desire and a longing for peace, and within the two um, opposing factions, we pray that there may be men and women of peace who don't want to see what's going, uh, happening, don't want to see the terrible evils that are taking place, but uh, are prepared to be peacemakers. And Lord, we remind ourselves that, that you bless those who are peacemakers. We pray that you will bless them and that you would equip them and use them and give them strength and uh, determination uh, to do the right things at this time. And Father, we, we also pray for this nation of ours at this time, because although there's not a, a war situation or a conflict situation, we know that in one sense this land of ours have turned their backs upon you and upon the peace that comes in, uh, with Jesus Christ. And we do pray for the leaders of our nation, we pray for the members of the royal family as well and ask and pray that you would raise up uh, people there within the royal family and within um, the government and the opposition who will be people of, 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 of God, people who love Jesus, who will be able to go past the, the politics of, uh, of today and direct our thinking and our ways towards uh, your laws and your ways and towards the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for that moving of your spirit to stir up your churches once more, to stir us up once more, to take away the apathy that seems to be in our, our nation concerning spiritual things and that, Lord, we might know something of your uh, spirit working in the hearts and the minds of the people of this land, that we may once more be uh, seen and known as a people that love Jesus and a church that is going out uh, to share the gospel with, with others as well. To that end, we pray, Lord, that you would be with us uh, as a church as we would seek, Lord, to uh, make the gospel known in the community at large. We pray, Lord, for the church officers meeting on Tuesday, that as they come together, that, Lord, you would... Uh, grant a wisdom and discernment, uh, a vision of the work here and 
uh, uh, longing and a desire, desire to go and make that gospel known. We pray, Lord, for the coffee morning uh, tomorrow and pray that that will be a, a very profitable time as we meet and we, over coffee we might perhaps share uh, our love and the things of Christ with others. And for the toddlers, Lord, we thank you for uh, the numbers that gather. We thank you for the mums and the dads and the grandparents that have come with their children. And I pray, Father, that there will be good and profitable conversations with uh, those, uh, those, those uh, people. And we pray for the younger members of the church. We think of those in Sunday school at the moment and ask and pray, Lord, your blessing upon them. Oh, Lord, uh, in their tender years, uh, may you come to them and speak to them and uh, reveal to them, Lord, uh, the preciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he truly is the very Son of God who came down on earth to be the Son of Man and to be the Lamb who take our sins away. And so we pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to look at that passage in Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to verse 33, and discover that the Lord Jesus Christ has some trouble with the scribes. Uh, the scribes were m mostly Pharisees, weren't entirely Pharisees, but part of their role was to, um, to copy out the Old Testament scriptures. They would, the, the various uh, copies of the prophets and the, the scriptures of the Old Testament were written out, because they obviously didn't have <laughs> typewriters in those days or printing presses, and they would be, their function, their job was to, to write out the, the but they were also uh, lawyers in that sense of trying to implement the laws of God in the land. But most of them had gone uh, somewhat uh, astray from the, the truth of God's word and the reality of, uh, 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 of what God was saying through the Old Testament. And Jesus had trouble with them. But uh, before we actually come to the trouble, let me, by way of introduction, uh, mention the fact that we're going to have a theme of the day. It doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes the morning sermon sort of ties up with the evening sermon. And uh, that's what's going to be happening today. And the theme, morning and evening, really, is to look at how Jesus answers some difficult questions coming from the Pharisees, from the scribes, the Sadducees, and people like that. How does Jesus answer a question, difficult question? Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at uh, the woman who uh, was caught in, a, uh, in adultery, uh, John chapter 8, and see how Jesus responds to the, uh, the question that was given to him by uh, the Pharisees. But this morning we're going to be looking at the question that Jesus is asked uh, by the scribes and the Pharisees, and it's in, John, it's in Mark 11, verse 28. Uh, what has happened is that because of Jesus uh, has done so many things that has really upset uh, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, he's so upset them that they are really worked up, really annoyed with him. Of course, the reason for that is, well, he's come... Uh, riding on a donkey, there was the triumphal entry that we read earlier on in the chapter uh, where the people were singing uh, praises to him. He's coming in the name of, of David, Hosanna to the king. Um, he's made this wonderful entrance <laughs> and they tried to stop him. And if you remember some of the other accounts from the Gospels, Jesus said, well, if you try stop the people praising me, the very stones would praise me, would sing about me. And then there was the cleansing of the temple. This was the domain of the, the, of the Jewish leaders. And yet Jesus did something that they should have done. It had become a den of thieves, as he as, as is reported, when it should have been a house of prayer. And they should have done that, but he, he, he's made them look silly. He's made them look uh, as if they're not really being that religious and very spiritual. And there are other things as well, like the raising of Lazarus, and we freed of that in the Gospel of John. And all these things have so upset 
these religious leaders that they want to kill him. They want to destroy him. And we get a flavor of that in the next chapter, in Mark 12, verse 12. And they sought to lay hands on him, not just simply to get hold of him, but to destroy him. But they feared the multitude. Jesus is popular. Uh, there's a crowd that gather around him. For they knew he had spoken a parable, and we'll see the parable uh, on another occasion, against them. So they left him and went away. There was nothing they could do at that moment. But they would do a few days later when they arrest him and when they crucify him. So that's the theme of the day, how Jesus answers the question. So our first point really is to say, well, what's the question? Well, we've already quoted it. And it's this, they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you the authority to do these things? You can imagine the kind of people that were coming to, to Jesus. They really have got angry. Who gave you the right to, 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 to cleanse the temple? Who gave you the right to come into Jerusalem the way that you did? Who gave you the right to teach the things that you teach? Who do you think you are? What's your authority? And you can imagine the kind of anger that's behind that question. What they're trying to do is find something against Jesus. Anything that they can use to, to, to turn the, the, the popular opinion of the crowd against Jesus. Anything they can find that they can take to the, the, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate and say, this man's against Rome, he's against Caesar. And they're going to try many times in the next few days as, we, as you go through this gospel according to Mark and the other gospel, you see that there were many occasions where they came with their tricky questions. Questions about paying taxes to Caesar, for example. Or the tricky question about uh, resurrection life. The Sadducees coming and saying there was a, a, a woman who had five husbands, who each husband had died. Who's, whose wife is she in heaven? So there are plenty, plenty of tricky questions, of course. But also we'll discover as we go through these chapters that the Lord Jesus Christ was also teaching against these religious leaders, saying of them very deliberately that they were hypocrites that they were saying one thing with their lips but doing another thing with, with what they did. And we see that, we begin to see that in Mark chapter 12, the next chapter, verses 1 to 12. But let's remind ourselves this is Holy Week. This is a, a concentration of all the anger uh, against Jesus uh, being concentrated in these next days leading to that point of his arrest and then his crucifixion. And each time Jesus is asked a tricky question, like this question in Mark 11, verse 28, when they question, you know, what authority do you have to do these things? Each time it demonstrates, I think, the deity of Jesus. It demonstrates that he is not just a man, but he truly is God come in the flesh. Because each time when these, these clever Sadducees and these clever Pharisees and these clever scribes come to Jesus, and they are men of intellect, Jesus, we see, has an infinite wisdom and knows how to answer them. He has, uh, we see something of the immensity of his mind. There's another occasion, I won't point you to it yet, but there's another occasion in the Gospels where uh, these Jewish leaders seek to arrest him. They send the, the temple police to get Jesus, and they don't arrest Jesus. Uh, and they come back, these temple police and the, the Jewish leaders say, why haven't you arrested him? And they say to the religious leaders, no man has spoken like this man. And that's what we see in these ways in which Jesus answers these questions uh, from, these tricky questions from uh, these religious leaders. But by way of application, we have to say this, I think. 
that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we truly are believers, we know that people will ask us questions. It was one of the interesting things I remember my daughter uh, on Wednesday was talking about how um, she was having a, in, a, in a cafe somewhere and uh, to, to invited uh, somebody and it was just supposed to be a coffee drink. And as they were talking about all these things that the particular woman wanted to know about things like how was Jesus the Son of God, how was Jesus at uh, the virgin birth, uh, and all the theology was coming out of these questions. And this happens to us sometimes, doesn't it? That as we, we, we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, people look at us, they, hopefully they'll see there's a difference between us and the world, they might see a difference between us and uh, the lifestyle of the world and ourselves, uh, they might see a difference in what we say and what we think about the Lord Jesus Christ. They might know about a relationship that we have with God because of Jesus. And they will ask questions. Now some, prayerfully, will be genuine questions. Genuine searching questions, uh, questions of interest, uh, um, and the people wanting to know, what's this all about? Who is this Jesus? Why do you go to church? Why do you sing hymns? Genuine questions like that. But others, well, they might be a bit more like the devil's question to Eve, you know. Did God really say? Because there would be evil, uh, mischievous intent in some of these questions seeking to make you look stupid, seeking to make you look ridiculous. Now, perhaps like me, you've had questions being thrown at you, and uh, one of the things that always amuses me, really, is that sometimes when people ask me questions, I say to myself, well, I've heard this one before, because there's nothing original. Sometimes people think they've come up with an original question, but they haven't really, because probably in the days of, well, I'm certainly in the days of Peter, uh, he was being asked the same kind of questions. Well, when's Jesus coming again then? Because nothing's happened. Well, read, read 1 and 2 Peter and he'll answer the question for you. But you know the type of questions that people um, give us sometimes. What about Jonah and the whale? I don't know how many times I've been asked that question. Who made God? That's a good one, actually. <laughs> That caught me out once when I was much younger, but I've got a good answer to that now. What about the virgin birth? Well, these are quite good questions. If they're honest questions, genuine questions, then when we, we, can, we, can, we can deal with them. But sometimes they're just being thrown out there to make you look stupid, to make you look ridiculous. How do you answer such questions? Well, if you're wondering how about Jonah and the whale and who made God and and what about the virgin birth? You're going to be disappointed this morning because I'm not answering those questions. But what I want us to do is to look at how Jesus answers questions, tricky questions. So that was the question. Uh, they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you the authority to do these things? So the second point is the reply the reply of Jesus. We've seen the answer. Let's listen to the reply. So if we go to Mark chapter 11, verse 29 and 30, uh, we get the reply of Jesus. But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Let me just stop there a moment, because Jesus is aware this is a trick question, and he knows, he knows that that's going to, whatever he's going to say, a normal answer anyway, they will use against him. And the question that he poses to him is this. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me, he says. Well, that really is coming out of the blue, when you think about it, isn't it? That he... He, he, he answers it in such an unusual way. First thing you ought to note here is that Jesus doesn't answer the question of the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, he really doesn't answer that question at all, does he? In fact, uh, if we go to uh, 
verse 33 there, uh, we, we know that they say to him, they're not going, they don't know, and Jesus says to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. He's not going to answer that question. What's he doing? Well, the first thing we can say is this. He answers a question with a question. And that is very clever. It's so clever, in fact, that you discover politicians have been doing that for the last couple of hundred years, haven't you? When people, when you've got these politicians are going, uh, people asking them these difficult questions, um, you discover they will an, a, answer the question by posing another question. But Jesus got there first, didn't he? But the really, really clever thing is this. The way that Jesus, the way that Jesus answered the question. <coughs> Let's read this again. And then... Um, well, let's, if I can go back, I think, let's go back to the question, let's, what, what Jesus answered. Uh, there we say, but Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you uh, one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. That's what he says, that's his reply. But what happens? Well, you see the reasoning of the men. These are clever men, okay? Remember, they're not silly men, they're not stupid men. These are clever men. And they say this, and they reason among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? And if we say from men, they feared the people for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. And so they come up in verse 33 and say, we don't know. What's happened? Well, it's a bit like a chess game. And Jesus has checkmated them. He's captured the queen. He's won the game. They're speechless. They can't answer the question. Because whatever they answer, they know they're going to lose. And so they thought they were very clever. They'd come up with this question, what authority have you got to say this? And they thought that perhaps he might say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's because I'm the son of God. And they might put a charge of blasphemy. Or they, he might have said, well, well, you know, I said, my own authority. And they might use that against him, against the, with the Romans, saying, this is this man who's, who's setting himself up as some sort of authority against you. But Jesus doesn't answer the question, doesn't need to. He checkmated them, hasn't he? They don't know. So, by way of application, again, let's, uh, let's, put it, let's say this. We don't have to answer any question that is um, given, uh, directed to us. But what we do need, we need is a, a, a wisdom to discern whether it's a genuine question from a genuine heart that is seeking more about God or whether this is a question that's only designed to cause trouble. If it's not genuine, it's not a genuine question, you usually find that people are not really prepared to listen. They'll go on to something else. So what I do sometimes is this. In reply to somebody who poses me a question, I might actually be bold enough to say something to this effect. Do you really want to know the answer? And if they say, yes, I really want to know the answer, well, I say, well, here's a book. <laughs> There's lots of books that can answer the questions that people give us. Here's a book. You read the book and see what it says. I mean, I've got one in, in, in my library, which has got the bold title, Why Does God Send Anyone to Hell? Given that book, and it gives you, he's got the answer. Are they prepared to read a book like that? Are they, perhaps you might say, well, they, you know, have a word with a pastor. He'll be able to give you the answer to that question if they're being genuine. Because if not being genuine, they won't read the book and they won't go to the pastor. Or perhaps you can say, well, let's turn over the pages of scripture. Let's read what the Bible says about these things. 
And instead of being genuine, they will turn to the scriptures and they will want to read the scriptures to see what the Bible says. One way I often answer questions sometimes, and you may have noticed this <laughs> in the Bible study, is to say something like this. Well, what do you think? That's a good way to answer a question because it does two things. First of all, it gives you time <laughs> to think of the answer yourself, and sometimes we need that, don't we? And secondly, it tells you where somebody is, what they are thinking, and the way uh, they, they process their mind. And we've got to be careful when we answer questions that we don't, we're not out to score points. You know, some people, they, uh, they have a discussion, they have questions and answers, uh, and if you're not careful, especially if you know what the answer is, and especially if you, you, you think it's a silly question, the problem is that you can just go up some points, make somebody look stupid, make somebody look silly. You mustn't do that. Because we should uh, love our neighbours. Well, let's look at the answer again that Jesus gives, uh, that perfect answer. So Jesus gives the perfect answer, and the perfect answer was this. I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ has given a tremendous answer, <laughs> hasn't he? He's able to do this, and he's always able to do this because of who he truly is. He is God, a truly man and truly God. And in his perfections, he is all-knowing, all-discerning, and all-wisdom. Uh, he can do what we can't. If you would never win an argument with Jesus, would you? Whatever question you would throw at Jesus, he would always give the perfect answer. But we're not like Jesus. We're finite human beings, aren't we? Our minds often are not firing as quickly as, uh, as Jesus' mind. Um, one of the things I've learned in my ministry is whatever you do, don't argue with a lawyer. I know a couple of men who were lawyers, barristers, and <laughs> they became ministers. And when you get involved in a discussion or a debate with a, a former barrister who's become a minister, you've got no chance because their mind is sharp. And I get... I wake up at four o'clock in, in the morning and discover that's the answer I should have given to this man. But we're, that's, uh, that's not us. We're not Jesus, are we? But there are, I think, four things to do and to remember when people ask you questions, how you answer the question. The first thing is this. Pray for wisdom and pray for discernment. What I like to call arrow prayers. There are times when somebody will come and fire a question at you and you think, help. <laughs> well, pray. You can fire an arrow prayer. Lord, I, I need help to answer this question. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your mind, in your heart. And God will give you that wisdom. And God will give you that discernment. It's an arrow prayer. How am I going to answer this, Lord? And then I think there are times, this is a second point really, that we need to prepare ourselves, especially when we are meeting with non-Christians and perhaps those type of kind of non-Christians are going to be asking us lots of deep questions. We need to prepare ourselves with the answers. And one of the best ways to prepare ourselves to answer somebody is to make sure we know the scriptures, make sure we know our Bibles, because the answers that we want to give them are the answers that we find in the Word of God. Because that's the only answer, really, isn't it? And, of course, like I suggested, that you could go to certain books, or certain Christian books, for example, that have already some brain or other has uh, thought about the question, thought about the answer, has written a book about it. They can be very helpful. Uh, and uh, coming in a, a direction we wouldn't have possibly thought because the questions that we so often face are not original. 
And if you know anything about church history, you'll know that from the early days of the early church fathers, the same sort of questions that were are being thrown at us today are the same sort of questions that were being thrown at the early church fathers as well. And then a third thing is this. We have, we have support. The support is that, is that of God himself, the Holy Spirit, the help of the Holy Spirit in all this. Let's go to uh, Mark chapter 16 and verses 12 to 14. This is the night in which our Lord is betrayed and he t tells his disciples he's going to leave them, he's going to depart, he tells them about his death. But he tells them about the coming of the Holy Spirit who's going to be with them and he's going to help them and equip them and dwell in them. And he says this, verse, thir verse 12 of uh, John 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it uh, to you. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help us to answer those questions, to give testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. And another text here is Luke chapter 21, and verses 14 to 15. And Jesus again speaking to his disciples. Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. That's the gift that God has given us. If we know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, he's given us the ability through God the Holy Spirit to answer those who would be against us or against the Lord Jesus. But a final thing, I think, is that whatever we say to somebody who posed some question, some tricky question towards us, we have to respond in love. That's the most important thing. Sometimes the answer isn't that important, but the way that we respond, and responding in love, is the thing that makes the difference. So don't be cruel. <laughs> I've, I've learned from experience, especially as a younger minister sometimes, that when you, you definitely got, have got the answer and you can really you know, hammer somebody with their question because they haven't really thought about it, you can be cruel. You need to be kind. You need to be not patronizing because it's easy to become patronizing if you think, oh yeah, I've heard that question before, and therefore, you know, you silly man or you silly woman, this is what the answer is. But loving. And all that we do and all that we say, as we share something of the gospel with people, there is one thing that we need to bear in mind. And it's something that we find in the scriptures, we find it in the Old Testament, we find it in the, the New Testament, you know, when Jesus talks about the, the summation of all the commands of God, which was to love God with our heart, mind, being, spirit, we're also to love our neighbors as ourselves. When people ask us questions, there may be genuine ones, we need to find out whether it's a genuine question, or if somebody's have, having a go, taking, taking the mickey out of us. But whatever we do, Remember this, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And whatever we do, we should be doing it in love. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way that Jesus answered those uh, Pharisees and those scribes who were trying to trick him, trying to, to get him to say something that they could use against him. We thank you for the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, which shows us once more that he was the divine Son of God. And we confess, Lord, that uh, we know we haven't got that mind, 
we haven't got that infinite mind and infinite wisdom of Jesus. But we praise you and thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit and that, that promise that through the Holy Spirit we'll be able uh, in some way to answer uh, the questions. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you'd help us to be uh, testifying to our Lord Jesus, uh, saying about how much we love him. But more importantly, Lord, help us to show a love for our neighbours. In all that they say to us and all that they may do to us, we pray that our response in all this would, to be, would be to love them as ourselves. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.